At this point, we want to start talking about inverses and invertibility, and we're going to start with transformation inverses, or the inverse of a transformation. So as you know, we've been talking about this general idea of a transformation, where maybe we have some subspace A and some subspace B, or subset A and subset B. So we have A and B, and we've been saying that A is a set of vectors, so we might have a vector, we'll call it A1 in A, and we might have a vector B1 in B, and we might say then that we have some transformation T that is mapping vectors in A to vectors in B. So the transformation T is starting with a vector A and transforming it into some vector that's in B. Now our main question at this point is, if we start with a vector A in A, and we use the transformation T to map it to a vector B, so if that transformation maybe looks like this, we're using this transformation T to map A, the vector A, to the vector B, can I then find the inverse of T that will start with B1 and map it directly back to A1? So in order to figure out whether we can do that, whether we can go from a vector A to a vector B and then from that same vector B back to that same vector A, we want to understand this idea of the identity transformation. So normally we call a transformation capital T or capital S, but we also have this idea of the identity transformation. And kind of in the same way that if you multiply a matrix by the identity matrix, the value of the matrix doesn't change. Well, in the same way, if you transform a vector using the identity transformation, it's just going to map you right back to the same vector. In other words, I could have an identity transformation that maps vectors from A to vectors in A, and furthermore, I'm not mapping to a different vector in A, I'm saying that if I take the identity of the specific vector A1, and we'll call this, since it's the identity transformation for the subset A, we'll call it I sub A. So when I take the identity transformation of a vector A1, the result is still going to be the vector A1. So you can almost think about this as starting at the vector A1 and just using this identity transformation and ending right back up at the exact same spot. I end up right back at the vector A1. In the same way, I could have an identity transformation for the subset B, so we'll say this is for A, this is for B, that maps vectors from B to vectors in B, and more specifically, not to other vectors in B, but if I start at the vector B1 and I apply the identity transformation, I'm going to end up at the vector B1. So that would, of course, look the same here. I start at B1, I apply the identity transformation for B, and I end up right back at the same spot. In other words, whereas the transformation T is mapping me from one vector to a different vector, these transformations, the identity transformation for A, is mapping me from a vector back to the same vector, and the identity transformation B is mapping me from one vector back to the same vector. Now the reason that we're talking about these identity transformations is because remember we started by saying we want to see if T has an inverse, such that if T maps A1 to B1, the inverse of T will map B1 back to A1. Well, the way that we're going to prove that is by showing that when I take T and then the inverse of T, I get the same result as the identity transformation. In other words, if I take T first of the vector a1. So I take A1 and I transform it using T, but then I apply some inverse transformation. So that inverse transformation looks like this. It takes me from B1 back to A1. So if I apply that, and we'll go ahead and say that's T inverse, then when I have this transformation of the vector A, and then I go apply the inverse transformation to that result, I should get back to the vector A1. Well, this is going to give me the same result as the identity transformation for A. In both cases, I get the original vector A1. And I can say specifically the identity transformation on the vector A1. I should get identical results in both of these cases. The left-hand side should produce the vector A1, 
the right hand side should produce the vector a1 and then I could do the same thing for b so I could say that if I start with the vector b1 so if I start with the vector b1 and I apply first the inverse transformation to that so I apply the inverse transformation in theory that should get me to the vector a1 then if I apply the transformation t to that result I should get back to the vector b1 so if I apply t to this result on this left hand side here I should get back to the original vector b1 well that should be the same thing as starting with the vector b1 here and applying the identity transformation for the subset B to that. When I do that, the result here should be the vector B1. So I get the vector B1 on both sides. Now, if these things are both true, then my conclusion is that T is invertible, or another way to say that is that T has a defined inverse. The inverse of t is defined, the inverse of t exists, t is invertible, t has an inverse. Now there are some important conclusions that go hand in hand with this idea of the invertibility of a transformation. If t has an inverse, if t inverse exists, then t inverse is unique. In other words, there can be only one way to define the inverse transformation. This is a property of invertibility. Remember before that we would often express a transformation as a matrix vector product? So we might say something like this. We would say the transformation of some vector A is equal to some matrix times the vector A, and we would express it that way. Well, think of this as if T is invertible, then I'm gonna be able to find some transformation matrix for the inverse of T just like this, where I can say the, transform the inverse transformation of the vector B, because the inverse transformation always maps vectors B, is gonna be equal to, and I should be able to express that as a matrix vector product. And this transformation matrix right here is unique. I can't find two different matrices that express the inverse transformation. There's only one way to define it. So the inverse is unique if the inverse exists in the first place. The second thing we wanna say is that an inverse is only going to exist if every vector A maps to only one B. So we could maybe call this A1 and B1. Every vector A, a specific vector A, maps to only one vector B. So if I can take some vector A in A and use a transformation T to map it, and it maps to two different vectors, B1 and B2, then I know right away that the transformation T is not going to be invertible. Its inverse is not gonna be defined. And then in the same way, the third property is that every vector, we'll call it B1, maps to only one vector A. In other words, if I can take a vector, we'll call it B1, and apply the inverse transformation to it, and it maps me back to some vector A1 and also another vector A2, then I know that transformation T is not invertible. It's not gonna have a defined inverse. All of these things have to be true in order for the transformation to be invertible at all, and if the transformation is invertible, by definition, all three of these things are true. These last two points, two and three, are closely related to the idea of a transformation being surjective and injective. And we need to understand those terms when we're talking about transformations and their inverses. So a transformation T is surjective. So surjective, or we also call that on two. So if you say that the transformation T is surjective, that's the same thing as saying that the transformation T is on two. And if we say that a transformation is surjective or on two, we just mean that every vector B is being mapped to. In other words, if I've got a bunch of vectors here in B, so we have the vector B1, the vector B2, the vector B3, if the transformation T is taking vectors in A and it maps one vector in A to B1 and it maps one to B2, but none of the vectors in A ever map to B3 
B3 is never getting mapped to by anything in A. If that's the case, then T is not surjective, it's not onto, because nothing's mapping to B3. In order to say that T is surjective or onto, I have to be mapping to every single vector B that's in B. Every B has to be accounted for, I have to map to every single one. And if I am, then it's surjective or onto. If T is injective, which we also call one-to-one, -one, that means that only one vector A is getting mapped to each B. In other words, if I look at my diagram again and I have the vector A1 and it is mapping to B1 and it's also mapping to B2, so when I apply the transformation to A1, it maps to two different vectors, then T is not injective, it's not one-to-one. -one. I can only have one vector A mapping to a particular vector B. So when I look at B1, there can only be one A1 that's mapping to it. When I look at B2, there can only be one A2 that's mapping to it. When I look at B3, there can only be one A3 that's coming in and mapping to that B3. If that's the case, then T is injective or one-to-one. -one. All these concepts here are related because what we know is that if T is both surjective and injective, or T is both onto and one-to-one, -one, then T is invertible. Or the other way around, if T is invertible, by definition, that means that it is surjective and injective. In other words, if T is going to have an inverse, if T is invertible, such that I can find a T inverse transformation, that means that T is mapping some vector A to every single B in B, so every B is getting mapped to, and that T is not mapping more than one A to a given B in B. In other words, there's one unique vector A that maps to every vector B. If that's true, then T is invertible, T has an inverse. So just to give you one more idea of what this might look like, let's just say that we have vector sets A and B, and within A we have the vector A1, A2, and A3, and in the set B we have the vector B1, B2, and B3, and then I went ahead and copied this so that we can see two different examples. Let's say that of these vectors in A we have some mapping like this, A1 goes to B1, A3 goes to B3, but A2 goes to B1 as well. Right away I know that this transformation is not surjective because B2 is not getting mapped to. And if the transformation is surjective or on to, every single B has to be receiving something. It has to be mapped to from some vector in A. I can also say that this transformation is not injective because we have two different vectors A mapping to the same vector B. And in order for the transformation to be injective or one-to-one, -one, I can only have one A at a time mapping to each B. If I look at a different example here, let's say A1 is mapping to B1, and that A3 is mapping to B3, but that A1 is mapping to B2 as well. Now I could say that the transformation is surjective because every vector B is being mapped to, but we would still also say here that this transformation is not injective because to be injective means that every vector A is mapping to a unique B. And here I'm mapping the vector A1 to two different vectors. I'm not mapping A1 to one vector alone. So the relationship between A1 and a vector B is not a unique one. A is mapping to two different vectors B, so it's not an injective transformation. Only when we have the relationship where A1 maps to B1, A2 maps to B2, and A3 maps to B3, where every B is getting mapped to, and every A is mapping to only one B, that's when we have an invertible transformation.